Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll move on a little bit after a very nice coffee break and perhaps now it's uh, time uh, to also express a very big thank you to the hosts of the whole event. And um, thank you, thank you for that. And that's uh, Dr. Mariusz Dorobantu, uh, who's actually the host of this event today and now he will contribute uh, to the program uh, by his uh, uh, lecture, Could Robots Become Religious or Spiritually Intelligent? So we are looking forward to that. Uh, I'm not sure if you're uh, aware about the person who's standing here, uh, but perhaps just a few information. Uh, Mariusz is a research associate at the Faculty of Religion and Theology here at the Freie Universität Amsterdam, and also a fellow of the International Society for Science and Religion. His doctoral dissertation, uh, he defended at the University of Strasbourg in France, investigated the potential challenges of human level AI for the theological understanding of human distinctiveness and the image of God. His current research project carried out within an interdisciplinary team of psychologists, computer scientists and theologians is entitled Understanding Spiritual Intelligence, Psychological, Theological and Computational Approaches. And I am sure this presentation is part of it. So we are thrilled to discover more about your research right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I was so excited about this topic that I organized this whole day event just to have a pretext to, to, to debate this uh, question whether robots uh, could, could become religious or spiritually intelligent. And I will tell you what I mean by both of these uh, in just a second. So uh, let's start with the, the news that brought me to this topic. Uh, it was, uh, I think in June, when a Google engineer uh, made waves by claiming that the AI he was working with uh, had become um, sentient through a, he was working, of course, this AI hadn't been released to the public yet. I don't think they have uh, done it in the meantime, but this engineer was working closely with the, uh, with, with, the, with the software beta testing. And then through those conversations, he somehow uh, became convinced that he's talking to a real person and, that's, and then he started advocating for rights for, for, this, for this algorithm. And uh, of course, this made, uh, this made the headlines. What I think it was interesting about this are two facts. One, that he arrived at this conclusion by, uh, by seeing in his conversation the AI mentioning God explicitly, uh, mentioning uh, a very deep fear of being turned off um, and uh, it was for the computer, apparently it was uh, allegedly as uh, uh, akin to the fear of death. And also uh, the, the program declaring itself a spiritual person. So um, yes, well now that this is very old news, of course, with the chat GPT <laughs> thing. And, uh, but but back, back in the day, they, were, they had really debates, especially on, on national TV and so on is this program really sentient? Because of course, uh, for computer scientists, it might have been quite obvious that it is not perhaps, and there, there were good arguments for this, but for the general public it's just, well, if a Google engineer says it, maybe it is. Secondly, what's important about this is that the Google engineer himself turned out was a priest of some sort of a very uh, obscure um, version of, uh, I think it was uh, some, some, some version of Christianity. But that, uh, uh, in the end, he admitted that that had played a big role in, in his decision. So, so he did not decide the program was a person in his capacity as a Google engineer, as he did it in his capacity of a believer and a priest, of a religious person. So for me, this, uh, this is already uh, the canary in a coal mine, because it shows that probably in the future, we will have increasingly more discussions about what are these programs what do they claim to be? What, what do we make of that? Um, and of course, could they become religious? Uh, this is a huge question. And secondly, how would, would we even know it? Because uh, I think uh, we are in a very much methodologically in a, uh, in a conundrum here. And uh, if you trust the program, uh, the answer is simple, but then uh, how can we think about this problem? So um, I think 
there's a very big limitation on our perspective over religion and whether AI can become religious. Uh, because uh, as shown by the Google engineer example, uh, what we th think religion is influences very much how we look at such examples and also what we seek for in, 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 a, in our conversation with these chatbots. So uh, if you read the whole transcript, it's almost clear that he was looking for it in a certain sense. So he was trying to, to make the algorithm say these things. Uh, at least this is my, my reading of that. And also, uh, so not only are we biased in our judgment of whether AI can be religious by our own religiosity and our own concept of religion, but also it's true that we don't have any other example of religious creature. We only know humans that are apparently religious in one way or another, uh, almost universally, as has been said before. And uh, so we have a sample of n equal one. So generalizing from this is highly speculative. So please keep that in mind uh, uh, in the rest of my talk, take with a grain of salt any kind of generalization that I make. I think there are still interesting things that can be said from how human are religious, whether robots could also be religious, but of course the final world, uh, word cannot be said on this topic, uh, at least not yet. Um, so I think there are two ways to approach this question. One would be the theological way, and the other one is a more naturalistic approach to religion. So if I look at the theological way, I think, uh, well, what can, what, what can we say about religion from a theological perspective? First of all, there is this assumption that there is a God, a creator or a sustainer of, of, of the universe and life in the universe. And uh, there's a big theological claim that this God is interested in interacting with certain kind of beings or elements in, in this creation, one way or another. Now, Christian theology and Jewish theology, I think they are very rich in, in showing how God relates to various kinds of things and in, in various degrees. But uh, if we are to think of, of, of a more um, articulated form of religion like we have in humans, then uh, the question is, what kind of creature would robots need to become in order for God to be able to relate to them? And also you can ask this question from, a, from an evolutionary point of view. So if you think that there is a God who is interested in, in interacting with intelligent agents, um, also if there is a God who wanted to incarnate as one of the creatures, then there's an obvious question, what do you need, how long do you need to wait in evolutionary times, uh, uh, in, order, in evolutionary terms, uh, how, how much time do you need or what should happen, what kind of threshold needs to be broken through for God to become able to incarnate because we think God did not incarnate as a um, worm or as a crocodile or maybe he did, we don't know. I'm using gender language about God just as a limitation because this is what I'm, I'm not, uh, uh, um, I don't want to say he or she every time, but uh, uh, I don't want to genderize God. Uh, so, uh, so we we don't know about that, but we know at least if we take Christian theology seriously, we we think God incarnated as a human being. So that might tell us something about what kind of creature God needs in order to relate. And here you have a whole theology of the image of God, imago dei, in Christian uh, and uh, and and Jewish theology which is uh, related very much to the notion of human distinctiveness. So uh, we think we are a creature apart and our relationship with God is part of that. Um, but also opens up all kinds of questions about exotheology. So this is the theology of potentially extraterrestrials. Mm -hmm. And what I always get frustrated about is when you have this kind of discussions in theology, there's always the question, can we preach to them? Could we preach to Martians? Could we baptize Martians? And for me, that is skipping so many steps ahead in the sense of what a creature would need in order to qualify as a member of a religion or of a counterpart to God in this kind of I, you, or I, thou uh, relationality that uh, I want to bring more specification to, to, to that. And also you, you can talk about, so I, I said exotheology, you can also have robotheology. So you can think of 
whether robots could become this kind of uh, uh, creatures worthy of, of being in a, in a, in, in, in a religious, religion, uh, religious relationship to God, then the question is, uh, what kind of religion would they develop? Would they be Buddhists? Would they be Christians? And there are fascinating discussions in theology. For example, uh, even if we say these robots would choose to be Christians for one reason or another, there is a discussion about what kind of theology within the Christian confines they would prefer. For example, perhaps the Pauline, so the, the, the theology of the Apostle Paul of the flesh, which uh, in Greek, sarx, uh, this flesh theology will probably not appeal to them that much because they are not flesh. They are algorithmic and they are silicon based. So maybe perhaps the Johannine, so of uh, the theology of the Apostle John, uh, the theology of the logos would be more appealing to to synthetic creatures precisely because they are more logical so they are more algorithmic so this is uh, uh this is a fascinating topic or uh, there's a question of whether uh, a robot could look at the christian uh, gospel and the christian revelation so, so to say and uh interpret it as speaking about itself so not about human beings and there is a interesting case that a robot could do that. Of course, it would need to be very creative about thinking of such things. So for example, about the immaculate conception or about the incarnation and in, in very algorithmic terms, so the resurrection and the death of Jesus would be just uh, a turning on, turning off of a, of a divine kind of algorithm. But uh, there is an argument that an artificial creature reading the, the, the biblical text could look at it and would say, uh, okay, this can apply to me, and it would make a theology that, uh, surprisingly enough, can stay within the canons of Nicaea and Constantinople, which in Christianity define what can be said uh, in, uh, as orthodox theology. I'm not sure I buy that into that argument completely, because again, it's making a lot of leaps of, uh, uh, um, of faith, but I think, I think it's interesting. Well, um, I, that's not the kind of thing I want to talk to you uh, about today. Uh, I think it is interesting at least to, to I, I bolded here the word intelligent because I am uh, critical of it. I'm not sure that intelligence is what is needed by a creature in order to be uh, in relationship with God. So even if we take, maybe you share or you don't share the God uh, assumption, but uh, let's, uh, uh, if, if we take it as a, as a hypothesis, then I don't think that you need to, 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 to be necessarily intelligent in order to be valuable and relatable by this God. So my own research in my PhD thesis was that actually what makes humans distinctive and appealing to God is not the, uh, the intelligence in the sense of problem solving or reasoning, also because AI shows that we are not the only ones who can do that and actually we don't do that very well. Uh, so you look at other things. If you look at the person of Jesus Christ as, let's say, the uh, prototype of the perfect human and uh, the image of God, then perhaps other qualities such as uh, uh, um, super humility or super empathy or super love or super altruism become more salient than super intelligence. So that in itself is a, uh, I think it's connecting very much to the criticism Tim made about our quest for intelligence as the important thing that we should instantiate in robots. And um, also, uh, I think that if you look at AI and you think it can be more intelligent than us, and at least in some respects, this also can also uh, talk about the interesting possibility that we as humans inhabit a sort of Goldilocks of intelligence I borrowed this from planetary science, where a planet is not too far and not too close from its parent star to have uh, liquid water. So maybe we need, I mean, I think humans need some sort of intelligence to be able to intelligently relate to God, but perhaps beyond a certain threshold, you become too intelligent and you lose out on other things that are valuable. And I will talk about them a little bit later, which actually make us human, which is not having complete access to your own processes, not, having, not being self-sufficient in the sense of knowing everything that you need to know and not needing to relate to other, uh, other creatures. Uh, if you think about it, this kind of perfectly intelligent being, uh, Pim was talking about 
uh, a scale go to 100 or 1000 or 10,000 or who knows, uh, sky is the limit. But if you think about that theologically, um, this kind of creature is a sort of uh, an, a monster in some ways in that precisely because it is perfect in its cognition, uh, it is difficult for such a creature to enter authentic relationships. Just think about whether you would like to marry such a person who never forgets anything, who, <laughs> who always has the right answer for every. I mean, it would be insufferable. And in, in certain ways, if you look at sci-fi, you do, you do see glimpses of this in, in the depictions of AI. So if we look at AI, what I'm trying to say is that if we look at AI as a, as a sort of mirror of what, of what we are not, then we might come up to, to value other things, maybe surprising things about what makes us human uh, uh, and not necessarily our intelligence and our cognition, which was used to be the story for centuries, at least from, from the times when Aristotle said that humans are the rational animal. Um, but if we look at religion, so this was the theological look at religion. Religion is just this way of, uh, there is a God who wants to reach out and uh, this God will reach out to any creature that is sufficiently intelligent or relational or so on. But if we look at religion in a more naturalistic way, so more from the perspective of uh, cognitive science or evolutionary anthropology, this is, religion is just something that humans do, right? We are agnostic about whether about its uh, truth value. We don't know whether when humans pray, there is somebody actually listening. That's not what we're interested in in this, in this uh, paradigm. We're just looking at why religion evolved in humans in the first place, to look for clues whether religion would also emerge in uh, in in robots sometime in the future. Um, and I, I ask here whether religion is a convergent point, a convergence points or a great attractor. And in evolutionary science, convergence points are these uh, uh, features that uh, many species develop independently from one another on different pathways uh, and in different times. For example, flight or sight. Uh, apparently, uh, these are uh, sort of great, great, great attractors. So if you give life, biological life, enough time on a habitable planet, uh, most of the times through natural selection uh, and all the processes involved in evolution, uh, life will develop such capacities. So if we look at the question from this perspective, we can ask, is religion such a convergence point? Like if we have intelligent life of many sorts or synthetic life, uh, is this something that inevitably arises at some point? And again, we don't know because we are the only sample, uh, we are the only example of this, and we did develop religion for one reason or, or the other, we will see immediately. But this can be illuminating in our trying to understanding where, whether robots also could, could, uh, could develop uh, a similar kind of religiosity. So uh, because any discussion of religion is based on human example, uh, it will become increasingly important uh, whether robots, intelligent robots, are also human-like or not. Uh, and we will come back to this point uh, later. Um, I will use two lenses for looking at religion. One is uh, uh, anthropologist Robin Dunbar's social brain theory, and the other is the notion of spiritual intelligence that we use in our project uh, at the ISSR. So first, let's talk about Dunbar. He's an Oxford anthropologist. Um, and in a very recent book published this year, How Religion Evolved and Why It Endures, he offers a very provocative understanding of, of uh, the evolution of religion that I think might be illuminating for thinking about potential religion in intelligent robots. Um, Ro Dunbar go goes against the grain uh, in, in, in what is called cognitive science of religion in that sometimes, very often, uh, religion is seen as something maladaptive, which is to say that the human mind or the human brain evolves certain capacities for very particular reasons and purposes and contexts, but then when taken out of context, those capacities can misfire in a very strange way. So uh, one popular, um, one popular uh, hypothesis is the so-called hyperactive agency detection device. Uh, which is to say that 
our minds see more causality than there actually is. And this is precisely what, I mean, Pim was criticizing AI for not seeing enough causality, seeing only correlation, where we humans, we have a hyperactive causality detection device. And to put it very simply, I hope I'm not making, uh, uh, I'm not oversimplifying this, but this is to say that if you are a, a hunter-gatherer human in, in the African savanna, and you hear something in the bushes uh, moving, it pays off for you to be super paranoid about it and think that it's a tiger and run away, even if it's just the wind, uh, then to stay there, uh, most of the time it will be nothing, but one time it will be the tiger and it will eat you. So uh, evolutionarily speaking, it's, uh, it's rewarding to be a bit paranoid and to see more causality and more agency than there actually is. So the theory goes, primitive humans saw this kind of uh, agency everywhere. They saw the, the sun, they saw the thunder, and they believed, okay, there must be somebody there throwing uh, arrows at us. And this is how religion evolved. Uh, so this is a very kind of byproduct, a side effect of this hyperactivity of our mind. Um, well, Robin Dunbar goes, goes against that. And he says, no, uh, religion is not maladaptive. Religion is actually very useful and there are very good reasons why humans developed religion. Uh, and one of them is that religion promotes increased bonding. Um, this, is, this is both at a psychological level. So when you, when you and me both are part of the same kind of re religion or religious ritual, there is some bonding going on between us psychologically, but it's also happening neurologically. So, uh, certain activities that are very present in religious rituals, like dancing, like eating together, like singing, um, they uh, trigger a huge endorphin releases. Uh, endorphins are the natural painkillers of the brain. So they, they give this uh, feel good uh, sensation that everything is well in the world, you're happy. Uh, your pain threshold is also increased when, when, when there's a release of endorphins. And very importantly, uh, if you do the kind of activities that I mentioned earlier in synchronized fashion, so synchronicity uh, boosts the, the, the endorphin release. And for Robin Dunbar, that was a very important thing in, in, in promoting uh, this kind of uh, group bonding. And uh, also religion reduces social friction. So when you move from the... Um, uh, actually, even before you move to, to, to bigger societies, because life in a community is quite stressful. So uh, if there is too much stress, infertility rates can skyrocket. Uh, there's conflict between members that has to be resolved all the time. So for him, religion is this great resetter. So uh, you accumulate tension in the group, but once every few weeks or months, you have this huge uh, religious festival where everything is just uh, almost wiped out because uh, you bond with each other again. So religion actually has benefits both at the individual level, uh, and he speaks about increased immunity and so on for people with, with uh, high endorphin release, but also at the group level. So religion was selected for if you want to evolutionarily. And also when we think about uh, the transition from hunter-gatherer societies to uh, agricultural um, societies and then to these big cities, um, religion promotes collaboration on large scales because it bonds people through common, common beliefs and the feeling of kinship. And here, uh, a very important explanation about what uh, he coined as Dunbar's number. You may have heard of this number. Um, this number, uh, 150, well, uh, let's put it the other way around. We are social apes and we don't relate, we, uh, the, the special way, of, the special feature of our relationality is that we relate to each other as individuals. So for me, it's, it's, I don't just want to relate with another member of my species. I want to know who that member is in order to trust that member. So I want to know their whereabouts. I want to know their preferences. I, not, I want to know who they're friends with. I, know, I want to know if they're plotting behind my back and all kinds of things. So this is very computationally costly to keep track of more people and it, uh, and it grows exponentially. So uh, our brains are limited in that to a number that is around 150. 
This is actually three times as high as that for chimpanzees or orangutans or other great apes. But this throughout our history has been a very um, a literal uh, glass ceiling for the dimension of our communities because you go higher than 150 and immediately you, you lose this sense of familiarity. People cannot tra keep track of each other. So human communities have usually bonded in groups that converge around this number. And what's funny, you can also see it in our contemporary society because our brains haven't evolved uh, uh, significantly since then. So uh, Dunbar gives a lot of examples. For example, if you look at the average number of uh, uh, guests on a wedding list <laughs> invitation, it, it's about that. If you look at the size of uh, modern army units, it's around that. If you look at the number of meaningful connections most of us have in their life, uh, it's about that at any given point. So this number stays with us in a sense. And he makes a case that also religious communities nowadays are most successful when they uh, are around that uh, 150 number. But um, what the argument says is that without religion and without this ability to believe in shared narratives, we could have never broken through the glass ceiling of 150. So maybe we would, have, we would live even nowadays in, in this kind of small tribalistic communities. But when, when we moved to agricultural societies, uh, that's when uh, our population increased. And then there was a need for doctrinal religion, uh, which is only the second phase. So he groups the evolution of religion in shamanic and doctrinal. And shamanic is this hunter-gatherer phase, which is very immersive, very much centered around ritual, around trance dancing, among, around the experience, sometimes with psychedelics. Um, uh, this, is, this relates very much to the uh, animal part of our brain, if you want to. And then doctrinal religion, so actually having beliefs and a theology about the existence of certain gods and relations between them, this comes very late. Uh, evolutionarily speaking, this is only 10,000 years ago or even more recently. So that's a blink of an eye in the history of our species. And uh, again, what Dunbar here uh, very interestingly says is that the second phase did not replace the first one. So actually the religions we have today are both shamanic and doctrinal. Even if maybe we are inclined to look at them as doctrinal, uh, the shamanic part, which is the, the experiential part of religion, are very important. And religions who fail to, uh, to take account of that and emphasize only the uh, rational adherence to some dogmas and some, some, some principles are not very successful. Whereas religions that emphasize ritual, touching, doing things together, uh, they are appealing to a more ancient part of our brain. And this is exactly uh, the way religion evolved in the first place. So this is interesting, and uh, also because um, when you look at, uh, at the key terms for the evolution of re religiosity, what I see there are mostly quote unquote negative features of, of, of our human nature, which is our vulnerability, our need, our, our need for connection, for cooperation, the body is very, very important, especially in, in the shamanistic phase of religion. Our mortality is important. So I think all these things were crucial for the development of religion because now uh, moving to a discussion of, uh, of, uh, of robots, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not sure AI uh, is characterized by the same kind of limitations. So what I try to argue here is that uh, the, we developed religion because we needed it, first of all, without saying anything about the existence of God. I'm just saying that from a human, from functional perspective, religion fills a very important role. And whether or not humanoid robots will also become religious, I think boils down to very much whether they will have similar needs from our own. Otherwise, uh, I don't think this will just magically happen uh, with them. Also, because uh, when I look at the discussion of religious AI today, especially the Google engineer, but also others, it's always a discussion about doctrine. So uh, does, the, does the AI believe in God? Does the AI have existential questions? Whereas if we look at the actual history of how religion evolved, this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? You cannot have that and lack the whole uh, shamanistic, if you want, uh, um, massive 
uh, load uh, below. Then we are moving to something that uh, Dunbar calls the mystical stance. So this is, uh, he believes that mysticism is crucial for religions. And of course, mysticism, uh, he boils down into three elements. Uh, one is that you have to believe that there is a spiritual or transcendent world of spirits. So this is an invention actually of the human mind because there is, that is not evident in nature. So somehow humans are, are prone to believe that there is such a world and probably Probably this comes from our mortality because if humans become uh, aware of their mortality by looking at other fellow humans and seeing that they die, so eventually everybody dies, uh, that's a logical conclusion to draw. And then of course, there's something in you that resists that and you think that cannot be the end. And then you're very creative in thinking about this world of spirits. This is one element. The, the, the next is our the ability of our minds to enter altered state of consciousness. So uh, religion is very much related to trance in, in, in Dunbar's theory, um, either intentionally or not. So you can enhance that with drugs or with trance dancing. Um, and also there's, there has to be a belief that the kind of spirits that you encounter in, in that uh, trance state, in that altered state of consciousness, they have some stake in our real world. So they want, uh, you can summon them to help you or pray to them. Um, all these things are, are involved. And also important for religion is the ability for mentalizing. I'm not gonna get into details about he, uh, this here, but it's, it's, it's first of all, so first order mentalizing is just to be, it's a sort of metacognition. So uh, I believe that uh, something is true. I have to imagine that my mind is something different from the actual reality. And then, uh, uh, so this is actually, this sounds very intuitive to us, but this from a cognitive point of view, this is a huge step. Then if you believe that I look at you and I believe you believe that, this is second order mentalizing, which in psychology is sometimes called theory of mind. So I imagine that you have a mind. I look at you, you tell me one thing, but I, can, I know you have a mind. So I think you may think differently. Um, uh, and this is a crucial capacity. Uh, for, for dealing with the complexity of our world. But uh, what Dunbar says is that most humans are capped at about fifth order mentalizing. So I believe that you believe that she thinks that he did and, and uh, already our minds are, uh, are resisting this kind of, um, it's difficult to hold together this, but he makes an argument that for religion, you need at least fourth order mentalizing, if not fifth. He says that fourth order is required for personal religion, and fifth is for communal religion. Now, moving to robots. Uh, well, let's first speak about this kind of hallucinations. I, I sometimes hear people talk about the utterances of GPT-3, at least those when it was not that good, that they were some sort of hallucination. So you asked GPT-3 to generate a story or to write a news report, fictitious, of course, and it would just hallucinate something out of uh, just as a human mind would uh, almost randomly compose something of its, from its unconscious. So you can think of uh, in religious practices, we have this speaking in tongues. So uh, uh, glossolalia, so people are in a sort of altered state of consciousness and they just utter words. Sometimes it's nonsense, uh, most of the times. Uh, and that's a sort of hallucination. Well, does GPT-3 also hallucinate? Because this apparently is a, uh, is a, is a crucial capacity for being able to enter trance states. I don't think that's, that's a very uh, big leap from, from uh, uh, AI hallucinations to what would be needed for uh, the kind of experiences that you have in religion. Um, also the awareness of mortality, which we saw that is uh, crucial for the emergence of religion in the story. Uh, I'm not sure AI has it. I mean. It declares it in discussions with uh, like, I'm, I'm, af I'm afraid of being plugged off, but we know that is just a statistical utterance of uh, uh, probably it's so that somewhere in a sci-fi story or in a um, Reddit forum, and it took it from that. <laughs> and then the ability to mentalize. So I'm not even going to go to fifth order mentalizing because I think AI currently is not capable of first order mentalizing. So AI does not have a mind, at least, what this is what I see this, I think this is what I heard Pim saying. Uh, this is related to the notorious hard problem of consciousness. 
We don't know why we have minds, why it feels like something to be us. So uh, it's difficult to say what, what is needed for AI to have that. But I think AI so far has not made the leap to the first stage of that. Once it does, if ever, I think going to fifth order and even more uh, would not be that, kind, that difficult for an artificial mind. But uh, so far it doesn't have that. And uh, this brings me to the, to the classical distinction between weak AI and strong AI. So from a behavioral point of view, these two are identical. So this is AI that for all purposes behaves as if it's human. So you cannot tell it, but one has a soul on the inside or a mind or a self, whereas other, another is just a simulation. It's just a, uh, this kind of chatbot that is tricky. And we don't know whether strong AI is possible. But what I try to argue here is that uh, even if strong AI is possible, so even if AI could acquire a mind somehow in the future, that would still be um, very non-human-like. And I will come to that at the end of my talk. Let me talk a little bit about this project that we are having uh, at the ISSR about uh, understanding spiritual intelligence. Uh, so this is a very interdisciplinary team of, of people from various uh, um, fields, uh, which were called together in this diverse intelligences initiative. Uh, we are trying to see whether there is a certain way for the mind to, to, involve, to, to engage in spiritual uh, practices and in spiritual life in general. So um, I will share the slides later also. Uh, what we are not looking for is yet another type of intelligence. You may be familiar with Howard Gardner's uh, taxonomy of, uh, of uh, music intelligence, uh, emotional intelligence, and so on. Um, we are not looking for yet another type of, of, of intelligence. Uh, what we are looking for, and uh, this is mainly uh, following uh, the intellectual leader Fraser Watts, who, uh, who is the leader of the team, is uh, we are looking to see how the human mind is deployed in a distinctive way in spiritual contexts. So we think that there is something different about how the mind uh, um, works in spiritual context, be them spiritual experiences uh, or the day-to-day -day life, but with a spiritual um, touch. And we think that uh, spiritual intelligence is not about knowing different things. So it's not about uh, having access to this uh, transcendence that is just about uh, above us and you just need the right antennas to pick it up. Well, it may be that as well. But uh, we think it's mainly about knowing things differently. So a different way of processing information. Um, we are working with the assumption that there are two minds. This is very common in psychology. Um, the assumption that the human mind is actually powered by two big engines of cognition. And uh, the particular architecture we are working with is this interactive cognitive subsystems that you do not have to, to, to look at the scheme. I will explain what is relevant about it for, the, for this topic. But you can see this all across psychology. So you can see it as uh, right brain versus left brain type of cognition. You can see it as uh, reason versus intuition, or you can see it as um, um, the elephant and the elephant rider. Uh, or the monkey and the accountant. So there are, there are many metaphors that go about the same thing, that there are two ways of, of doing cognition. One which is very intuitive and inarticulate and phylogenetically very old. So the kind of mind that we share with non-human animals, or at least uh, it has its roots in, in other species mind. And the very um, language oriented rational type of mind, which is sometimes associated with the left hemisphere of our brain, which is very typically human. Um, and we are looking at how spiritual intelligence can balance these two modes of cognition, because uh, there is the assumption that, uh, especially in our Western uh, science powered uh, society, we tend to deploy the rational mind more than it is uh, designed to. So uh, there's a fascinating book called The Master and His Emissary, which says that the right brain is designed to be in control and the left brain should serve the right brain. But what we actually did is we made the left brain to be the, um, the master. And this is probably uh, 
at the root of many of our current problems. So we think that in spiritual practices, because the way they are designed, and we are talking here about various types of meditation, mindfulness, uh, Jesus prayer, other mantra-based meditations or prayer, uh, we deploy our mind in a very specific way, which gives the lead to the more intuitive, implicational, and bodily connected type of mind. And the very rational mind is either shut down or it is uh, constricted in a, in a meaningful way. So that, uh, that leads to a, a different kind of doing cognition. And that in, um, in its turn can be afterwards deployed in day-to-day -day situations. So that's why doing spiritual practices does not have effects only during the spiritual practices. You can actually become a different person in normal life interactions if, uh, if you do these practices consistently. That's the hypothesis. And what is uh, interesting here to see is that if you look at these two uh, main engines of cognition, one is implicational and one is propositional, you can see that, for example, information that feeds from the body, which is the body state, is never going directly to the propositional uh, um, subsystem. So your articulate kind of mind does not have direct access to the body states. That is always mediated through the implicational mind. And we think spiritual meanings also occur very much in this implicational mind. And then, of course, they get translation to propositional, the propositional mind, and that's how you get theology. But theology is always limited to a translation of what the actual experience has been. I'm not gonna insist too much on this, but uh, a, few, a few characteristics of this are interesting for our discussion. And uh, I will just look at the ineffable here, which is that spiritual meanings, as I said, are sometimes difficult to put into words. So uh, spiritual insights arise at the more implicational intuitive level. And also that uh, slow processing is very important. And I'm not talking here about Daniel Kahneman's fast and slow. I'm talking about the kind of slowness that stretches over long periods of time. So for example, even a lifetime. So some patterns become recognizable only if you give them uh, their required time. What, some things I think cannot be computed on fast forward. And this applies to spiritual meanings, we think. Um, uh, what, that does, what, what does that say about, um, about AI and this possibility of acquiring spiritual intelligence? I'm obviously racing through all this because this uh, is a, each question here, I think, deserves its own talk. But let's talk about this dual mind. I know that in AI nowadays, they sometimes use dual cognition in the sense, maybe a little bit different from the left right brain or the implication of propositional. But for example, if you look at the uh, generative uh, adversarial networks, you have two networks that work. Uh, um, I don't have a slide here, but they work against each other. So one tries to trick the other, the other tries to, to, to catch it. So like the policeman and the thief. And together, they elevate each other to higher levels of competences, just like the predator and prey evolve together. Uh, so I think this is a proto model of the dual, cognit dual cognition. I can also look at AlphaGo, which was uh, uh, this huge achievement in AI. Actually, I was... I've been playing Go for more than 25 years now. So when I, when I saw this, it was just unbelievable. I actually cried when, when this happened. In, uh, I think it was in 2016. And that's how I got interested in, in AI in the first place uh, is because we thought this will never happen. But the way they achieved it is also through a dual uh, cognition model. So there was a network that just learned what the good moves are from looking at human games. So without actually understanding very much about the game, it just got a feeling of what good moves are. So this is very much akin to the intuitional uh, kind of intelligence. And then there's the uh, value network, which evaluates every position and predicts a, a likelihood of winning the game from that position. So that I can, if I am allowed to make a very brute uh, analogy, could be very similar to our uh, rational or uh, propositional type of mind. So I already see this in AI, but I'm not in a position to say whether this already amounts to the kind of uh, dual cognition that exists in humans. But it's just to say that uh, if AI is to make steps in that direction, uh, perhaps 
this will be regarded in the future as, as the first steps uh, toward the kind of cognition that humans do. And then the conclusion is that maybe religion can develop if, uh, um, but, but if we look at the other slide, we look at embodiment, we look at participation in a higher uh, intelligence and so on. So these are all things that currently escape AI and are not even taken seriously. So uh, I don't see AI right now moving towards spiritual intelligence, not in the way we define it. Uh, and finally, I want to say that uh, what we see from everything I've said so far is that uh, what in the end will matter about intelligent robots is not how intelligent they can become, but whether they are human-like or not, at least for the question of religion. For other purposes, I think there are very, uh, um, uh, this might not be as relevant, but if you are to ask, can robots develop religiosity and or spirituality? I do think that they need to be human-like. And if we look at the current development in AI, this is absolutely not human-like. Yes, it does reach human level competency and sometimes superhuman level competency, but there are a lot of examples where AI achieves similar results to our own in a very different way. I think that's philosophically, that's very interesting that you can get the kind of results. You can get the kind of text generation that ChatGPT does without a mind. I mean, that's in itself is, is, is fascinating. You can get those, those pictures without having a human creator behind, but just through aggregating data from other humans. I don't think we thought that was possible a few decades ago, and now we see it's possible. But um, the technology is not moving towards being human-like. And if, if the limitations of our human nature are anything uh, uh, of importance to the development of religion, uh, I don't see, I don't think it's likely that AI and intelligent robots will uh, uh, develop similar processes without actually having the same kind of evolutionary constraints and needs. Um, so if you see in the future uh, algorithms that pretend to be religious, I think I would suspect they're either a trick or at least for the time being uh, some meaningless text generation, but without the actual substrate of, uh, of religiosity. Thank you. Thank you, Marius. And uh, I think now it's uh, time for quick uh, questions and answers, but we are also blessed by the panel discussion afterwards. So if you, if there is no enough time uh, for uh, all the questions and answers uh, in like 10 remaining minutes, we can continue during the panel discussion. So the floor is open for your questions and answers. Thanks, I, I, I really appreciated your talk. And I think I'm in agreement with lots of things. There's just one, one question that I have about a potential, um, if I may be so bold, inconsistency, potential, I'm not sure. It's just a, a question. So on the one hand, you speak about religion with these five types of intentionality, these five levels. And on the other hand, you speak very much about, let's say the embodied, um, almost kind of Damasio's uh, somatic marker type of religious feeling. Um, so, so how do you combine these two? Is that really the distinction between the shamanism and the discursive type or? Um, yes, I, what, the, fi the five level mentalizing yeah. uh, was more related to the kind of imagination one mind needs to have in order to imagine, first of all, uh, a god. So the ability for mentalizing actually is correlated with religiosity. Uh, for example, people who are low on that, uh, on the autistic spectrum, for example, uh, they also scored lower for uh, religion. So the ability to mentalize and also to mentalize in such a complex way is, uh, is important for, first of all, of having the idea that there is a god and then being able to share that idea with somebody else. So we think together there is a God and I, I know that you think that and I share your beliefs. So uh, I can go back to that slide. But, um, but, but, but my main question was where in the, 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 what was his name again, excuse me, Barnard's interactive cognitive subsystems would that five levels be? 
you know where where is it in that picture yeah is that the implicational meaning or is that no, the propositional no, meaning no i think that is in the proposition yeah 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 yes because that's a very articulate well it might be in the implication in the sense of the intuition of another mind uh, yeah or or even the existence of a god i mean otherwise it's just an ex well not just but a, a very important but it's just an experience not necessarily of god yes so yes. The, the religious nature seems to be necessary in the implicational but, but the way you describe it now it seems to be located in propositional so i was feeling some sort of tension there. I don't think it's located in either of them. Uh, and now I'm mixing uh, Dunbar's uh, mentalizing model with, uh, with Barnard's cognitive, uh, interactive cognitive uh -huh. subsystem. So I, 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 that, is, that was not my intention. I, I wanted to keep them separately. Uh, this is very much about what we call spiritual intelligence and which we think is, arises somewhere in the interaction between these two but in a specific type of interaction. So not in the, let's say the default mode of, of, of this working together. Um, whereas for Dunbar, uh, I don't think he even bothers to look at cognitive architecture. He looks at uh, neurology, he looks at endorphin release, he looks at the default network uh, and how it activates in mentalizing. And um, so the two are in a way complementary, but they come from different angles. Thank you. Thank you. Before I will see another hand, maybe uh, could well to both of you to add to this discussion. So when I see that and and, and heard a question, could it be that perhaps uh, I just recalled here um, uh, this 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 uh, distinction between first and second naivete of Paul Ricard? So the first naivete is a kind of a naive childish belief in something, and then you sort of rationally uh, well interiorize it uh, later and uh, but uh, and you know that some of the moments of your naivete is really naive but this second naivete it's that well i i know that something sounds ridiculous but i still accept it as a religion yes i think that's an interesting analogy yeah. and uh, it reminds me of this uh, ontology uh, recapitulates phylogeny a uh -huh. kind of argument where what happens in the development of the individual somehow recapitulates, recapitulates what happens at the level of the species in its development. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure it's exactly the same thing, of course, uh, because I think both naivetes uh, uh, operate at the more or less doctrinal level of religion. Uh, so I think they are both underpinned by a very heavy load of bodily... Um, Yes, intuitional kind of needs uh, that are fulfilled by religion. Um, so uh, you may think of the evolution of religion in humans as a sort of uh, naive uh, kind of uh, phase. And then, well, I think this is, this is the classical uh, yeah. cognitive science of religion uh, way of looking at it. Now I think we are trying to recover the naive part and say, well, that, that actually that's the religious part. What we made in the last thousands of years with all these uh, doctrines, this is uh, this is just a lay stage and it's almost an afterthought. But uh, it's actually the more animal type of mind, and our very much. I, I don't like the animal in this in the disparaging sense, but it's more like these bodily needs uh, that were important in the development of religion. And not that somebody sit on a rock and thought, oh, all this must somehow connect. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. I just realized that I kept you in the dark. So uh, I saw some very sleepy eyes <laughs> throughout the presentation, but I didn't think of turning on the light. Yes, hello. Um... I don't know how to start, but <laughs> yeah, you helped me to, uh, especially when you talk about shamanic and doctrinal, and you helped me to think about uh, indigenous religious perspective, also with world religion perspective, and I stay with uh, indigenous people for five months in forest, and when I see this, I realize one thing, that if we talk about could robot be more religious? For indigenous people, they don't have a problem for that. For me, they don't have a problem for that. But that's just who gets the problem for this thing, just who in their mind have a world, religious, uh, world religion per, uh, paradigm in their perspective. Why I say it like that, I'm sorry if I 
should share this. But for indigenous in indigenous religion perspective, when uh, I stay with them, who can who have a relation with God? It's not just human. So every entity have a relation with God. Yeah. Even the wood, even the uh, wind, the wind can talk to God, not just human. So uh, we should make a relation like uh, we should give respect to forests. We should give respect even just for this small glass. They will drink with a good, good, good. What should they? they will treat this glass so polite because they think that if I do something good, to this glass, this glass also will good doing good for me. So yes. this glass can talk to God. So if they think about God, this glass can talk to God, the wind can talk to God, the forest can talk to God. So they don't have a problem. If they talk about robot, robot can have a relation to God. So what's the problem? Yeah. So I think that's the problem just for world religion paradigm. And for thank you for you helped me to. You remind me for that. And so for me, I guess in my conclusion, the problem is our modern mind, also about our idea about religion. Yes. What do you think about it? Thank you Thank for you. sharing that. Yes, of course. Uh, I think you are right that, the, as I said in the beginning, the, the notion of religion that we have influences very much what we look for and uh, what kind of things we, 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 we test for if we are ever to test a religiosity in robots. On the other hand, I would say that uh, uh, indigenous religion may not be unique in giving um, dignity and even a relationship with, uh, with God to creatures. I mean, also in the Psalms, in the Jewish Psalms and uh, Christians later, uh, you see this uh, idea that the whole creation declares the glory of God. Uh, so in that sense, I, I do not want to relate the notion of religiosity to the dignity of the thing itself. I think this ethically is a very wrong way to look at it. What I was more interested is uh, whether, I mean, I don't think that just having a kind of relationship with God, even if it's just a relationship of a created creature with its creator, I'm not sure that qualifies as religion. I mean, for religion, I think uh, that's why I, I was looking more at the kind of developed religion in humans, whether you look at the shamanistic or the doctrinal phase, but there you have an intentional engagement by a creature and a sort of searching for, for, for relationship with, with, with God. So not just the uh, default relationship that is given through, through one's nature, but also a more, uh, a more intentional kind of engagement. So in that sense, I think there are some people who say some of the non-human animals have uh, features that we might call proto-religious, uh, chimpanzees uh, being in awe in front of the waterfalls or things like that. But uh, I think this is all very much below the threshold that we would look for in, uh, in other uh, in, in intelligent robots. Yeah, thank you for this really mind opening uh, speech and thank you for that comment because that's also exactly what I was, uh, what I've been thinking and um, I think rather, rather than dignity or the intentionality to engage in relationship, it's probably more about um, like the agency of something or object or non-human more than human ecologies could involve in like co-perform some kind of um, ecological relationship. And that also makes me think of um, in, in Buddhism, actually in Zen Buddhism, they also, in, in that trend of thinking, they also probably just take it for granted that of course robots can be religious, that they can have the Buddha nature. Um, it, it's also what Lily just shown like in the morning with the robot priest in the temple in Japan, because in um, Zen Buddhists, they tend to believe that everything also inanimate um, things, object or uh, non-human lives, they are sort of innate with this agency to become part of the enlightenment. Um, and then their way of sort of participation is not necessarily thought as like verbal or intentional sort of engagement, but just being there as a part of chain that um, mediates some relationship. 
um, in, in some way, like there are some uh, monks that would just sit in a garden and look at a piece of rock and becomes all of a sudden like um, having this awareness of, of the Buddha nature arising um, in him. So then this rock is also a part of what sort of triggers and affects the enlightenment or the compassion yeah. in people. So um, I, I was also thinking that might be a very interesting question to ask, like how actually it differs in different relation uh, in different religions, how people consider like if robots could be religious. Yes, yeah. yes. I think you are completely right. And to add to that, uh, there is a brilliant argument made by a religious scholar, Robert Gerasi, who says that the kind of religiosity that underpins uh, our different society, for example, Western uh, Europe and uh, the United States, as opposed to East Asia, is also the root cause for why in one environment you see uh, um, a preference for developing robotics, which is uh, the Japan and China uh, mostly, and then in, in the West you see a, a focus on AI and disembodied mind, because this is very much the kind of ontology that is uh, planted very deep within our culture from, uh, from the Jewish Christian uh, roots, um, where we are obsessed by this uh, saving this non-bodily uh, part of ourselves, the soul or the mind, and this is what gets to be uh, transfigured into a new kind of body. Whereas, as you mentioned, in, in, in East Asian ontologies, there is a very fluid, uh, there's no distinction between, not, uh, there is not, not this taboo between animate and inanimate, and that makes it much more easy to, to actually build robots than just to try to uh, upload your mind in a, in a simulation or uh, the things that people do in Silicon Valley. Thank you for that. And now, actually, you can uh, save not your minds, but bodies with a little bit more coffee yeah. before we will try to transfigure the space here into the panel discussion, which is the final uh, part of our program.